there's a million things to talk about here, but we have the lawsuit in front of us, the Nexon versus Iron Mace, but it's not just Nexon versus Iron Mace, it's Nexon versus Iron Mace and as individuals, Troy and Terence, which is the two main men over at Iron Mace, and at least one of these individuals also having criminal proceedings brought against them within Korea. This is the complaint for misappropriation of trade secrets and copyright infringement, and it's in Washington. Why is it in Washington? It goes through in the document, but it's in Washington because that is where Iron Mace agreed to do business by virtue of hosting their game on Steam. Steam's agreement is essentially if you are publishing on Steam, you agree that any lawsuit or anything will be in that territory. There's a lot of stuff to go over here. Um, I've read through this whole thing. It's long and it's obviously written in legalese, but it is quite understandable. And I am of the opinion, again, after reading this, that Iron Mace is probably fucked on this one. Not a lawyer. Uh, I'm just going to say that one. Obviously, I'm not a lawyer. I have no formal training whatsoever. But at least in the common sense of the arguments they're making, it's very difficult, even as somebody who wants to play Dark and Darker and isn't a big fan of Nexon, of course, people are going to say I am, that they don't have a point here. They make some very, very compelling arguments. And of course, if Nexon has all the receipts that they're saying they do, which will come up in Discovery, I don't see how Iron Mace wins. But let's go through it. Essentially, the beginning is just a big old word vomit of what Nexon is, what P3 is, and what the defendants are alleged to have done, which is basically all stuff we already knew. Nexon was making P3, Choi and Terence were working at P3, Choi in violation of not only his employment agreement, company policies, and express instruction transferred 11,602 P3 files from Nexon to his own private servers. They allege that the defendants accessed these files and other trade secrets gave defendants a significant commercial advantage once Choi and Park left Nexon to form Iron Mace. Now this is not disputed, by the way, this is not an allegation that is disputed. In Iron Mace's very own testimony where they came out to defend the DMCA, which of course you're only going to do publicly because it benefits you to do so, they even said themselves, yes, we had these servers. They even say, Nexon told us to stop using these servers at a certain point, but we continued anyway. So having access to these files and having access to files they shouldn't have had access to is not in dispute. This is a statement of fact. The dispute is what did they do with those files? And we're going to go through something here that will, that if true, will be very easy for Nexon to prove and will completely dispel any illusion that there wasn't foul play here. Whether or not it's legally actionable, I cannot say because, again, I'm not a lawyer. In terms of these two things they're alleging, the misappropriation of trade secrets and the copyright infringement, I can't say from a legal basis whether that's true or not, but I can say from a basis of common sense that there is no way you can explain this away if Nexon are in possession of what they're saying they are. So again, this entire section is just going through, you know, what they allege that they've done. Nexon made game, people stole files, was fired for doing so. Other people were convinced to leave and form this studio and make a game that is, and I'll quote them, substantially similar uh, to P3. And of course, substantially similar essentially means it's the same thing. And then it goes through what Nexon does to protect its trade secrets. Now, why does it do this? Because obviously, if you don't take measures to protect your trade secrets, it means they're not really trade secrets, are they? Therefore, you can't argue somebody stole your trade secrets because you didn't do anything to protect them in the first place from being stolen. So they, of course, go through the guidelines. So it explains Nexon is a video game company, so therefore video games and the development of video games are Nexon's most valuable asset. And it takes great care to protect them, including the confidential data and intellectual property developed by its employees using company resources to create them. This is a common sense point. I've seen a whole bunch of people making this point that you're an employee of a company and you should be allowed to leave a company and then just make a game that is substantially identical, essentially, to what you were working on before. I don't think that makes sense in moral, legal, or really any kind of common sense perspective. Because at that point, what is copyright? Are you just allowed to copy anything that anybody does? The world couldn't work that way. You couldn't go and work for a company, have them pay a whole bunch of people to make something, and then just leave and make the exact same thing. And I'm not talking about copywriting genre ideas because people keep getting this twisted. I don't understand what words I'm using that people then hear and, and go with the, you can't copyright a genre. Nobody is ever at any point saying that you can. Nexon's not said it. I've not said it. Nobody interacting with the facts on this case have said that. What you can copyright is a collection of things that make an idea unique to itself. 
So basically what they're saying here is when you employ people, which is common sense, you give them guidelines as an employee. What can you do? What can't you do? What we're paying you for? What your job is? As you can see, security guidelines for Nexon employees, security guidelines for service and application program development and operations, guidelines for information security, operation of informational systems, service guidelines, guidelines for protection of personal information, in-house security procedures. So when you join Nexon, you give in all these things. You have to agree to all these things. And according to the company policies and guidelines, Nexon employees cannot use Nexon's proprietary information for personal gain. Now, of course, the law supersedes what a company says. So, for instance, people have been given this example of non-competes. In most circumstances, and especially in the United States, non-competes are essentially worthless. There's very few examples of where they would be actionable. In fact, at the moment, they're trying to actually ban non-competes full stop because they're anti-competitive and also at the same time it's unfair for an employer to basically be able to say you are uh, an expert at this thing so we're employing you to be an expert at this thing but once you leave our company you can't go and use your expertise to earn money doesn't make a lot of sense does it so non-competes is irrelevant here i've seen people bring that up and i just want to dispel it on both sides non-competes play no factor and of course the company saying you agreed to these terms so therefore you can't do x y or z doesn't matter if it's not legally enforceable so what their policies and guidelines say is just to illustrate the point that, that all employees were aware of what is principally at least what I would believe legal, which is if you work at our company on things that are paid on company time, you can then not go and disseminate or recreate the things that you were exactly paid to do and work on while at our company. To again illustrate that Nexon takes their uh, trade secrets seriously and informs all employees and gives them documentation of guidelines written by lawyers of what you can and cannot do. That's why this exists. All of Nexon's employees receive company training on information security at least once a year. Additionally, the company policies and guidelines post on the company's main group where are easily accessible by all Nexon employees. Nexon also requires its employees to sign an acknowledgement about work-related in intellectual property acknowledged about company IP. Pursuant to this acknowledgement about company IP, any intellectual property rights in the company work product uh, created by Nexon's employees during the course of their employment originate from and are vested in Nexon. Moreover, Nexon employees are prohibited from using or recreating any content that is similar or the same as the work-related inventions made at Nexon, even after the employees leave Nexon and join another employer. Now, this, again, is common sense. This is how the world works. You can't work on something and then just leave and go make the same thing. And some people get mixed up when you say same thing. I don't mean like, I'm working on an FPS game, and if I leave and make an FPS game, therefore I'm, breach, I'm in breach of contracting and be sued. Nobody's saying that. I'm saying that if you work at, for instance, a cola company, and you know the exact list of ingredients that make that cola, and then you leave the company and make a rival company that makes a cola drink that has the exact same ingredients, that is presented in the exact same way, you're probably not legally in the right there. Probably a silly example, but you get why I'm going with like a really simple one on that one. Again, the rest of this section is just going over how we protect, protect our trade secrets. Essentially it goes over, you need to connect to their VPN to get access. You need these one-time passwords, usage of IDs to, to get access to servers. All passwords must be at least eight characters, combine alphabet numbers and symbols and reset every 120 days. Why is this important? Why is it important to prove that their servers that host all of their trade secrets are difficult to get access to, heavily monitored, and constantly require resubmission of details and IT to basically give you new access. It's because later on in the lawsuit, they're going to list the actual theft of trade secret and how essentially the employee bypassed all of this, all of this trade secret protection that Nexon uses to gain access to data that they should not have had, which then they alleged that they later on went and, and developed a game that's substantially similar to, to P3 with. Then they talk about Troy and uh, Terence were hired in April 16th, 2018. They previously worked at a subsidiary of Nexon before this, and they're just setting up the timeline for, you know, they knew about these things, they were inducted into the company, they had access to these uh, resources, and of course the servers and uh, processes that protect the trade secrets. Who was Troy? He was the director of the P3 project until his termination on July 21st, 2021. What did he do? They just explained, you know, how important he was, what he did, uh, and his ro roles and duties. Who was Terence? He was at Nexon. He was the head of the P3 design team during the entirety of the P3 project. What did he do? Explains. And then they explain the stages of game development. Why do they do this? 
Well, basically, they're putting forward how a game is made, because then later on they're going to argue, why was Dark and Darker made so quickly? How did they avoid A, B, and C? Because they skipped straight to D, right? Because the majority of a game being made, and this is true for all corporate structure, maybe it's not true for indie structure, which is, of course, what um, I, I assume I Mace is going to argue. In corporate structure, this is how it works. You pitch a game, the game gets approved. You prototype the game, then the game has to get approved from there. Then you go into pre-production and the game has to get approved from there. Then you go into production, the game has to get approved from there. And most games fail between A, B, and C. They fail between pitching, prototyping, and pre-production. Most games that are created by AAA developers in these big studios never reach production. They never reach post-production and they certainly never uh, get to launch. Why are they arguing this? One, because of, as I've just explained, the development timeline of Dark and Darker, how did they get to production and in fact be releasing playable versions of the game in 10 months? Where, was there no pitching, no prototyping, and no pre-production? Two, because they're going to explain how basically Iron May stole all of these things and didn't need to do these by virtue of the files that were taken on the server and the people working at the studio in the first place. And three, to show you that they used a lot of money and a lot of cost and basically the product was already going to be in development and was determined as a viable commercial success prior to it being taken from them and them having to shelve the product due to the fact that people stole the files, was fired, and then left and took half the team with them. That's why they're setting this up. That's why this exists. So I could go through all of this, but it's just going to be explaining what I just said. Um, you can read it. I'll, I'll leave it on screen for a couple of seconds so you can pause and read it yourself. If anyone wants me to do like a video where I go through literally line by line of this and explain, again, I'm not a lawyer, but this is a pretty dense document to go through in the first place. So I don't want to get hung up on like 50 minutes of just reading uh, definitions of game development. As you can see, during these 11 months of pitching, prototyping and pre-production, Nexon invested an enormous amount of time and resources in P3. Over 20 Nexon ex employees worked exclusively on P3 project, including Nexon's director and then all of the main employees. They invested 1.1 billion Korean currency, which is $841,944 into the P3 project to get it to the point of to get it to the point where everything went wrong. Now, again, they argue that with this investment of time, money, effort, resources, Nexon essentially had so much information put into this that had economic real value that would not be accessible to anybody outside the company, that these constitute trade secrets. That's what a trade secret is, right? Nobody would have had access to this data of this 11 months worth of investment from Nexon other than the people who worked on it. That's what a trade secret would be. And then they go over what some of these trade secrets would be, other than the, you know, tangible assets. Internal playtests, where various target groups within the company played the game, completed a detailed survey to provide feedback of the fun elements of the game. So this shows that a lot of the time and a lot of the budget on P3 was spent figuring out how to build the game, because that's how games are built, usually in these corporate structures. They go through this iterative process of, what is the game's concept? Is the game going to be fun? Now we have a prototype. What do people feel about the game? What could we change about the game before we go too far into development? So they were doing this for 11 months and spent a bunch of money on it. After it reached the pre-production stage on May 13th, 2021, Nexon ran another playtest to P3 with a direct level group in order to collect qualitative feedback on the strengths and weaknesses of P3, look and feel of the FPS perspective, proposed improvements to P3, and attractive features about P3. They identified the strengths, including the implementation of PvP, PvE, and then based on the positive feedback of the director group, they determined P3 would likely become a commercial success. And on May 11th, 2021, the P3 project team was notified the P3 received the green light for pre-production. On June 1st, 2021, the P3 project officially kicked off its pre-production stage. Now I've seen a lot of people and I've been saying, you're wrong and you need to wait for the lawsuit to come out so you can see that you're wrong. A lot of people have been saying P3 was cancelled and Nexon is upset that, you know, these people left and made a game that they weren't going to make anyway. They were making the game. It was approved to be made. You can see it here. And people are obviously going to go, Nexon's lying. You are not going to lie about this specific information in a court document. This is going to have 
documents to back it up. They literally had the playtest internally. If you've ever worked for a big company, you know all of this shit is filed, it's logged. They're going to be able to prove from digitally signed documents that this game was in production, that it was approved, that they would decided it was going to be a commercial success and they were going to move forward with it. They're going to be able to prove it again with testimony from employees who are still working at the company, who were not only overseeing and managers, but also people who were working within this small team making the game. So again, just another thing that publicly people are completely wrong about. Is there a chance that Nexon have decided to file a lawsuit where they're lying about tiny details that literally could be proven wrong and destroy their whole case? I guess, in some kind of alternate fucking bizarro timeline. Do I think that's the case? No, obviously not. Now again, they go over many of these trade secrets were saved as computer files on Nexon's secured company server. Why are they doing that? Because now they're going to explain Choi stealing the trade secrets while working at P3. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, Nexon temporarily permitted its employees to work remotely and access company data with strict policies regarding what content could be accessed externally. Indeed, in March 2020, Nexon informed its employees that they could not use any external storage systems without express authorization from Nexon. On August 31st, 2020, Choi requested permission from the IT security new development manager to export P3 source code outside of Nexon to his private server located in Seosan, Korea. Choi stated that exporting the source code was necessary to maximize efficiency while his team worked remotely during the pandemic. On information and belief, from August 2020 to, to January 2021, Choi installed Git on his external server to access the exported P3 source code. This is confirmed by Iron Mace, their statements, and by Nexon. So again, just another statement of fact. Why did they allow him to do this? Well, the P3 project was only in the early pitching stage with minimal source code developed. So it wasn't in production yet. It wasn't greenlit to continue. They'd not done substantial work on actual asset. And by asset, I mean code, design files, things like that. They were still pitching the game. There was nothing massively substantial that was a big concern. So they granted him temporary approval to export P3 source code for the purpose of testing the program. However, they did not grant him permission to export build files to an external server. Again, I'm going to assume there's going to be actual uh, time-stamped documents proving this fact. I don't believe a company as big and as old and as corporate as Nexon do not keep substantial files on things like this. Requests for pretty much anything will almost certainly have been kept. Starting in or around December 2020 through to June of 2021, Choi, without Nexon's authorization or knowledge, began transferring P3 build files via various methods and beginning in April 2021, Choi instructed his right-hand man, Wu Ming Yang, P3 program part leader, to export build files. He did so from Nexon's internal Jenkins server to his external server via remote desktop protocol, December 2020 to June 2021, FTP, file transfer platform, from February 2021 to April of 2021, and then via FTP, by which Choi automated Nexon's internal Jenkins server to send build files to his private servers on a daily basis from April to June of 2021. By January 2021, Choi had instructed the P3 project team to write source code using in-house Git that Choi had installed and mirrored on his external server. He did not request or receive authorization from Nexon to install or mirror the Git on his external server. So again, I imagine they're going to be able to prove this because it's a very specific claim with dates to make without the ability to do so. And people are going to say, well, they're not proving it to us. They're not showing us right now in this document. That is, that's not how a lawsuit works. Once they build a defense and this goes to discovery, that's when this shit's going to come out and we will have all the receipts. We'll be able to see everything. By February 2021, the P3 project was past the early prototyping stage. Therefore, Choi knew or should have known that the new development manager's temporary approval was no longer valid. You can argue, obviously, here that somebody always should have known. Again, ignorance is not a defense in any sense of the word. In apparent recognition that his export of P3 source code was unauthorized, on February 18th, 2021, over a month after Choi set up the mirroring to his external server to exploit source code, Choi again requested authorization from Nexon's new development manager to export P3 source code. He expressly rejected Choi's request. When making his request, Choi did not inform the new development manager that he had already mirrored the Git to his external server to export P3 source code, as well as transferred P3 build files. So I'm doing this anyway. I'm going to go and ask for permission. I don't tell them I'm already doing it. They say no. I continue doing it. In response to this request, on the same day, the new development manager advised that Choi and his team needed to come into the office to work on P3 in person. Why are they doing this? Well, because he's saying, oh, we need to be able to do this to work efficiently because I need this private server to have all the stuff. And their response, well, well, all of you come in then. If you can't work efficiently from home, 
you can't do it on the server that would be an infringement on how we protect our trade secrets you've all got to come into the office and work again this will be documented and then they explain it now they had more substantial and valuable source code thus to protect the source code the new development manager advised Troy and his team that they needed to come into the office in person rather than exporting the source code and work on it from home Troy agreed to do so in April of 2021 so look at the timeline February 18th he asks for permission April 2021 doesn't have permission he set up an additional private server in his home in a different physical location even though Troy had been explicitly instructed not to export or store P3 project data outside the company, he continued to do so through June 2021. They've literally admitted to doing this publicly, by the way. So when people say, maybe Nexon's lying, they've admitted to doing this. You can go read it in their own statement. In fact, from February to April of 2021, Troy and some other person, whose name I can't pronounce, a P3 team member, transferred P3 files to Troy's external service through various methods, including eight separate exports of P3 build files via FTP. Now, why would you need to do this if you're from February 18th working in, in the studio? If you're not working from home, why would you need to be transferring for multiple months after the fact, after not being given permission? Why would you need to be transferring all of these things that you know you're not supposed to be transferring to private servers? If you read through the Nexon blind post, which is anonymous employees confirmed to be working at Nexon, they state that already by this point, Troy was upset and was trying to convince people to leave the studio and go and make a new studio, saying he had investment already and they were going to just go and make the game again and basically cut Nexon out. Which, of course, as a narrative, this lines up perfectly with. Starting on April 6th, 2021, after the new development manager expressly had told Choi he could not export the P3 project data, Choi doubled down on his theft. In addition to the source code mirroring that began in January of 2021, he continued to download thousands of P3 build files. By doing so, he exported 2,747 P3 build files to his external server between April 6th, 2021 and June 18th, 2021 and 1,719 P3 build files to his personal server in Songnam between April 7th and March 13th. So he's doing it at different time periods on two different servers while being expressly told, no, you can't do that. Despite the express instruction saying that he couldn't do this between May and June of 2021, Troy connected to the in-house Git to download P3 source code on Exxon's PC and then exported the source code to his external servers. To minimize his conduct, Troy dissembled in public statements that the use of this private server was necessary to develop P3 during the period when COVID-19 prevented employees from working in Exxon's office. This is a statement I'm talking about. It's on Reddit. You can go read it. But no such private servers were necessary because Choi, like all the Nexon employees, had access to cloud resources through Nexon's arrangement with OneDrive and AWS that would have remedied any issues of connecting to the company server while working remotely. Furthermore, and again, how a lawsuit works is they're building the case here. They're building the timeline of what happened. This is not the totality of, of everything. These are just points. They're threads on the spider web that represents the entire web. Furthermore, of the 20 separate downloads of stolen P3 source code and art resources to choice server located in SOSAM, 18 downloads occurred after Nexon lifted its COVID-19 work from home policy on June 2nd, 2021. Of 20, 18 occurred after the fact. Now, his excuse for this was that he forgot about the server that he wasn't allowed to set up, by the way. He forgot about the server they told him not to have. And again, they will be able to prove this. No other team at Nexon in the similar stages of game devel development as P3 exported or transferred so source code or any other proprietary information to, to external servers during the course of remote working. So what is the point of that? Why are they saying that? Well, if everyone else could work from home perfectly fine during this period, why then is this one person who later on went to develop a game that is substantially similar to the game that he was developing for us using our trade secrets, our resources. Why is he the only one that has done those things to have needed these servers that he was told he couldn't have? That's the point they're making. Choi plots to steal P3 for himself. At the same time he was transferring Nexon's P3 data and files to his private servers without company authorization, he was soliciting P3 project team members to leave Nexon and develop the P3 project outside of Nexon. So bear in mind, again, dates. June 2nd, Nexon lifted the work from home policy, which means after this point, there would be no reason at all ever to have these files. He sent 18 of the 20 downloads were done after this. Now look at the timeline of this. According to interviews, Nexon's internal audit team conducted with the P3 project team members, Troy began approaching certain P3 project team members in April of 2021 and spoke with each team member individually in June 2021. 
to urge them to leave Nexon with him to recreate a game similar to P3 outside of Nexon. Confirmed by the blind post, they're going to have recordings and transcripts of him, of these employees being um, audited and, and interviewed. So again, he's already transferring the files in April. He's already talking about doing this in April. They were back in on June 2nd, and 18 of the transfers happened after June 2nd. In June, he was speaking with each member individually. So prior to the majority of the file transfers, he was already plotting to leave the company and take people with him to go and recreate the game. To persuade P3 Project team members to leave, he lied to them by telling them that Nexon had no intent to release P3 when Nexon had, in fact, approved of moving forward with P3. He explained to the P3 Project team members that because they had created the game once before, they would be able to complete and release the game within one or one and a half years. According to interviews with the team members, Troy told them that he had secured external venture financing for the new game, even while he was employed at Nexon. Looking like some bad news, guys. Nexon learns of his misconduct. They learned in June of 2021 because one of the P3 project team members went to the higher-ups and said, this guy's trying to steal your game. He's trying to poach the staff. They then moved to audit its server logs, leading to discovery that Troy had been transferring data to his external servers without authorization. There's a crazy smoking gun coming up here in a minute, guys, that people are not going to want to believe. And I'm not sure how people are going to mentally spin this other than, fuck Nexon, Nexon bad. We side with Robin Hood. As soon as Nexon discovered his, of his misconduct in June of 2021, Nexon demanded that he turn over the information stored on the external servers so that they could, of course, assess whether the stolen information had been disclosed to any third parties and what steps Nexon needed to take to prevent further damage. Troy intentionally spoilates evidence. After Nexon confronted him, he agreed to turn over his external service to Nexon so that the company could determine whether the data was disclosed to a third party. In fact, he signed a written forensic agreement with Nexon to turn over his servers. However, Choi quickly changed his mind and refused. Instead, according to Choi, he instructed an acquaintance to permanently delete the files on his personal servers. According to Choi, the service was wiped multiple times so that the data could not be recovered. Now, I'd like to know how he said this. If this is in text, they can prove you stole the, the data. They can prove you didn't have access... They can prove you didn't have permission to do so, which is what makes it a theft. They can also prove that you signed doc a document saying, I will turn it over. If they can also prove, if you wrote this in text and they have access to it, that you instructed somebody to permanently delete the files, you told them you would give them, you're deleting evidence of wrongdoings. I know again, I'm going to have to repeat this because it is worth repeating. This person is being criminally investigated in Korea. We already have precedent of somebody doing this in Korea. They went to prison. They were fined. They were found guilty for doing this. If this is true, which again, I don't know why you'd lie about this when a court is going to order you to turn over the evidence of this. All of this to this point, you would not make these allegations in this case if you couldn't back this up, in my opinion. Because what's going to happen is they're going to say, provide the receipts. If you can provide the receipts for this, nobody on the planet Earth can argue that what this person did was right. All they can argue is that, fuck Nexon, I want the game to come out anyway, I don't care if they stole, which thankfully has no bearing in a court of law. Again, I can't say legally whether or not this is actionable. Now, the problem is, is that they say here, if what Choi says is true, which of course they cannot confirm, which of course if they have this communication, they still can't confirm because they've never had access to the server, whether or not it was deleted repeatedly to make it impossible to actually forensically account. But if they did do that on this server, then the wiping of the personal server thwarted Nexon's ability to directly confirm the full extent of the data he stole and to directly confirm whether Troy exported data from his personal servers to third parties or to another location where he could continue to access and use the stolen data. So he could just have this server with all the data still on, but he's never turned over the server never provided evidence it's been wiped, never provided evidence that they haven't got access to the data still. He could have backed up the data from the server to another computer, or networked, whatever else, and then used that to build the game. That's what they're arguing, of course. Choi's admission that he willfully spoilated evidence raises an inference that his private servers contained evidence that he misappropriated and continues to misappropriate Nexon's trade secrets. This is blatantly obvious. Again, if they can prove that he literally said yeah, I've instructed someone to permanently delete it, even after I've said I've, I will give you access so you can determine I've not done anything really wrong. Why would you do that? Why would an innocent person, 
agree to turn over the server and then tell a friend to permanently delete the server. Let me know somebody why that would be the case. Although the full extent of choice theft cannot be fully known because refusing to turn over the survey, in July 2021, Nexon's internal audit team conducted an investigation that revealed that between December 2020 and June of 2021, Choi acquired and transferred without authorization at least 11,602 key files of the P3 project from Nexon server to his private servers in 2020 and 2021. These 11,602 files contain P3 trade secrets that include, but are not limited to, source code, art resources, and build files. Below are a breakdown of the files, the all 11,600, what are they? Development production program, visual data sources of levels, I'll not go through all of them. Now on July, tw now on July 12th, 2021, they terminated him. Why is this a big point? Well, because Nexon has a massive pro-labor union that essentially means that you're not getting terminated. If he was terminated without evidence, if the evidence wasn't overwhelming that he was worth disciplining and terminating, they would have been fighting this and he would have been winning a bunch of money or at least keeping his job. Then we move on to what did Iron Mace do wrong? Because so far, that's been all Troy. What has Troy done wrong? Well, what happened was following Troy's termination, one month later, again, we see July 12th, one month later, August 9th, Park left Nexon, Park, Terence. Nine other P3 project members representing nearly 50% of the team followed to and left Nexon. On information and belief, each of the P3 project members who left Nexon joined Iron Mace and they were the ones that had been solicited by Choi to leave Nexon's employment and join Iron Mace prior to Choi's termination. So again, remember, he was soliciting people to leave long before Nexon even knew what the fuck was going on. On October 20th, two months after he'd left Nexon, he founded Iron Mace. He co-founded Iron Mace and became the CEO. Choi, as well as the other nine members, joined Iron Mace shortly after. Now, a question to ask would be, why would Terence co-found the company and become CEO when he was below Choi in the pecking order at Nexon, but have Choi be the controlling shareholder of Iron Mace? And we've seen this. I went over the Korean uh, company registration document to show the shares before. Seems a little bit odd, to be honest. With most of the key P3 project team members gone, it was difficult for Nexon to continue the P3 project. Iron Mace completes the demo P3 and renames it Dark and Darker. Now they argue here, as described below, Iron Mace could not have developed Dark and Darker so rapidly unless it used Nexon's trade secrets to do so. Now I've seen people clown on this argument and say, lol, just because Nexon can't develop games fast doesn't mean that, that Terence and the boys can't because they're such good developers. If that's the case, why did P3, after 10 months of development, basically only just get greenlit for pre-production? Is it because game development's probably a little bit harder than that and they spent that time, as Nexon claims here, and what they were paid to do? Pitching ideas for a game, which took months. Getting feedback, prototyping, figuring out what the design of the game was going to be and iterating on things over and over again to the point where they had a cohesive game. While I'm not saying you can't develop a game from the ground up in 10 months, if you're doing that, you're probably copying another game idea, right? Not one-to-one, -one, you're probably just like, oh, I like Call of Duty. I'm going to make a Call of Duty-style lobby-based shooter. We have everything in front of us to just basically do similar, using our own code, using our own assets, using some unique gameplay mechanics so it's not a one-to-one -one rip. That's the argument of you can't copyright a genre, right? But as we'll see as this document continues, that's not what Iron Mace did. They developed P3 and just called it Dark and Darker. Again, they argue here they had no need to go through the concept pre-production prototyping stage because they did it all for 11 months on Nexon's expense. Indeed, in self-serving public statements, Iron Mace has set forth a timeline that it contends shows there is nothing unusual in how quickly it was able to release a demo of Dark and Darker. Notably absent from that timeline is any reference to the pitching, prototyping, and pre-production stages of Dark and Darker. The reason those stages are absent from Iron Mace's timeline is that they were performed by Nexon. Defendants simply misappropriated Nexon's trade secrets to skip over those stages. By stealing Nexon's trade secrets, defender, defendants conferred significant economic advantages to themselves. For example, the majority of video games fail before they get past the prototyping stage. When a game fails at the end of the prototyping stage, every hour of human effort and every dollar of investment in the game is a loss. So basically, they had a company that they could just make a game. There was no risk because they knew the game was already deemed by experts in the industry that have made many very popular games that this would be a commercial success. All the hard work had been done. He had been prototyped, it had been tested by multiple people, they had surveys from multiple groups within the company saying this is good, this is bad, change this, change that. They'd gone through 11 months of substantial effort to get a game idea and we're later going to see in this document that the game idea is the exact same fucking game. 
Again, they argued that Choi had knowledge of the results of the detailed surveys, what made the game enjoyable, which was also unknown to anyone other than Nexon employees, which gave them a significant advantage in developing Dark and Darker. The more than 11,000 files that Choi transferred also gave defendants a significant economic advantage. And then they go through the files. You know, what happened with files? Well, these files contained a log of all 733 revisions to the program files for P3 over the 11 month development process. By having a list of all 733 revisions, the defendants had a step-by-step -step guide to recreate P3 Iron Mace and accelerate the development of Dark and Darker, avoiding the time and expense of the trial and error process that Nexon was required to engage in. So they basically had a wiki how. How do I make ramen noodles? But obviously in a much more complex version. How do I make P3? This is what this guy had on his server, which he wouldn't turn over and instead destroyed purposefully after saying he would turn it over. Then they go over the other files. What about the level and accessory element that Choi transferred to his server? They go over the lighting, the uh, the actual levels, aka the you know the map. They go over the visual source data, which is data relating to display information and effects, such as the UI and they name here as an example the UI compass. Then they go over character and accessory elements, which is movement, environmental changes according to game conditions, appearance, movement, and skills dictated by the character ability and gaming condition are substantially similar. Then the planning data. It's critical at every stage of game development because it assesses the overall balance of the game and evaluates each character component, skill, equipment, vis-a-vis -vis each character. Then it goes over because of the files that they had. That's why the games are so similar because he had access to all the files. Then talks about the game prototype, the build files, which you would absolutely not be allowed to transfer to a private server. Anyone working at a company like this would know you, that's, you're not allowed to do that. He'd been told you can't do that. P3game.exe is a build file that runs P3 and is a prototype playable version of the game that also shows the source code as a result of the build. It's included in the file. It allows people to just unzip the file and run the game. It took Nexon 11 months to develop its prototype build files for P3. It's important because they contain game design, artwork, and planning data. They essentially serve as a blueprint for developing the game. Access to this would dramatically expedite the planning and designing stages of game development because P3 build files would serve as a guide on the history of P3 development and planning direction. They would be useful to all Iron Mace employees working on completing P3 under the name Dark and Darker. Moreover, with all of P3's packaging data at their fingertips, Iron Mace could save significant amount of R&D, research and development time, and resources by simply referring to the P3 build files of completed concept work and art designs. Then they go over the, the infringement of copyright, which is just going to be their US filed copyrights for certain things. Now, what are they alleging here for the source code copyright? They're saying that developing source code is hard and it's implausible that defendants could have written new non-infringing source code from scratch in the short time that Iron Mace has been in existence. It's much more plausible that defendants use Nexon's P3 code as a base, which they refined and augmented to develop the source code for Dark and Darker. Now, people can argue whether or not you could build Dark and Darker in 10 months and get the game in people's hands within that time period. You could make that argument, and that's what argument they will be making in court. And I'll be very interested to see what they say. Maybe they did. Maybe this is all a big coincidence. Maybe these things that they have him on, transferring the files, having the files, saying he'll give them the server, deleting the server, telling people he wants to leave the company and remake the game anyway, leaving the company remaking the game anyway. Maybe this is all a big coincidence and they're going to prove that despite all of those coincidences, he definitely didn't use any of the files he, he provably stole. Maybe I'm going to have egg on my face, but I'm looking at evidence. I'm not, look I'm not looking at what I want to be true. And it's going to get worse in a minute. Points to the fact that they were in the wrong. I don't know again if it's legally actionable, but from a common sense perspective, this seems like they were in the wrong. At the time Choi was soliciting team members, he clandestinely transferred at least 260 separate source code files to his private servers. Dark and Darker, which is substantially the same game as P3, is the culmination of Choi's plan to steal Nexon source code so that he could recreate P3 Iron Mace. Now, they're going to go over audiovisual copyrights, which is sound and sight of what you're seeing what you're hearing that has been that has been infringed in copyright and then the idea of the game they talk about how the idea of the game is the same it's an identical idea again people are going to get it twisted here and they're going to think oh you can't you know uh, wizards of the coast are going to be coming after nexon next because they stole dungeons of dragons that's not what anybody's fucking saying please please don't make me read that comment ever again both games set in a player versus player environment pvpve this means the players battle each other 
We all know what that means. Both games are first-person shooter FPS. Yeah, you're in first person. We know what that means. Both games have role-playing game elements RPG. Yeah, we all know what that means. Both games occur in a medieval setting inspired by the classic board game Dungeons & Dragons. While Nexon does not claim to own the idea of PvPVE, FPS, RPG, game inspired by Dungeons & Dragons, it does own the copyright in the particular expression of the idea embodied in the P3 audiovisual copyrights. This is the point that's lost on people. I, and it's so easy to understand. They're not saying they own any of these things. They're not even saying they own the combination of any of these things. They're saying their copyright is a combination of the, these things in this exact way, with these exact mechanics, with these exact uh, audiovisual elements, because it's the same fucking game. Because it's not fully explainable to list all the similarities uh, in a two-dimensional legal pleading, they then are going to go over some examples. This is, in my opinion, if you take it as an isolated point, probably the weakest point in this entire document. They say, in the core edition of Dungeons & Dragons, players can choose from 12 classes, and then they go through them. You know, Bob, Bard, Warlock, Wizard, etc, etc. Dungeons and D&D also has additional classes beyond the core 12. In P3, players can choose from one of six. Cleric, Ranger, Barbarian, Tanker or Fighter, Thief or Rogue, and Wizard. In Dark and Darker, you can also choose from six. Cleric, Ranger, Barbarian, Fighter, Rogue, Wizard. Same six. There's nothing inherent to Dungeons & Dragons inspired video games that would compel a developer to select precisely the same six character classes that P3 selected. True. You are right. Indeed, there are more than 900 unique combinations of six character classes that a game developer could select from a set of 12. When one considers that a game developer is not limited to choosing exactly six classes, but could also choose one, or 14, or any number in between, that results in thousands upon thousands of alternative choices. So they're arguing here, why did we choose six and this specific six? And why did they choose six and this specific six? They could have chose any flavor of the rainbow, but they chose the exact flavor that was developed at, at Nexon that was our game. Then they just go over examples of other games that have, you know, certain character archetypes that share with Dungeons and Dragons, but they don't have the exact same ones because obviously they're different games developed by different people. Nexon's choice of the six character classes in P3 was a creative choice, similar to the choice a screenwriter makes when deciding the main characters to include in a film. Defendants copied Nexon's creative choice wholesale. This is one point as an overall. Of course, if you make just that point, you can argue a million different reasons as to why this is a coincidence, right? But obviously they continue to argue the same points. They su substantially copied the visual appearance of those characters. Again, I think this is not the greatest point in the world. I'm going to have to turn this off. Oh no, it's light mode. Oh, I don't want to look at it for too long, so I'm just going to skip over this. But basically they argue why the concept art of the characters are the same. Viking man, barbarian. Why is it different from the Wizards of the Coast original source for uh, being a barbarian? Why is the cleric look so similar compared to the cleric of Dungeons and Dragons, the original source? Why is the fighter look so similar? Again, same shit. Why does the wizard look so similar? Again, same shit. Why does the rogue look so similar? Same. Why does the ranger look so similar? Oh god, thank god we're back to dark mode. To make its expression of the six standard character classes unique, Nexon gave the character classes a unique skill not shared by any other character class. For example, the barbarian in P3 has the ability to break down dungeon doors with his axe. No other character in P3 has the ability to break down doors. The ranger in P3 can set traps to injure his enemies. No other character in P3 has this ability. The thief slash rogue in P3 has the ability to pick lock chest without a lockpick. No other character in P3 has this ability. Dark and Darker copied these expressive elements wholesale. In Dark and Darker, only the barb can break down doors. Only the ranger can set traps. Only the rogue can pick locks. Now again, people are going to look at this in isolation and they're going to look at each individual point because they're coping that, that Nexon has no point and this is all bullshit. Look at the totality of everything in this document so far. Look at the totality of the design that they're breaking down and understand this continues on because the game is fundamentally, substantially the same game. This is not about, oh, well, just because a fighter wears a helmet doesn't mean they're the same game and they stole the idea. This is, if you look at everything, I, I don't see any world in which somebody can intake all of this and be like, nah, they've got no point at all. Iron Mace is in the complete right here. I don't know how you can get there, but hopefully if you are a skeptic, you're still with me because there's more. These elements are unique to P3. There is no existing trope in Dungeons and Dragons or video games that only a barbarian can break doors, only rangers can set traps, and only thieves and rogues can pick locks. Those unique aspects of P3 characters and defendants unimaginatively copied in Dark and Darker. Selection of Unreal Engine Marketplace Assets. This was the most brain rot opinion that I saw on the entire internet. People literally 
read the DMCA or, or maybe didn't even read, just somebody else said something and then they were like, yeah, that sounds stupid. You're absolutely right. Nexon is dumb as fuck. And they're just reaching and they're lying. What people saw was Nexon said, there's 2000 files here that we essentially got access to from, from downloading the game. And we opened it and we saw all the file names that have been downloaded onto our computer. And they share the same name as 2000 files that we have for our game P3 that these developers just happened to work on previously. And obviously iMace came out and said, you know, mic drop moment, all of these are unreal marketplace assets. So you're dumb. Ha ha ha. Everyone laugh at the dumb, dumb Matt corporate man who's saying that they own the copyright to unreal engine assets. Nobody ever made that point. Nobody ever made that point. That was not a point anyone ever made. The point they're making, P3 is their copyrighted game that they were making. And these people remade P3, a different studio, because they could only make the game as close to P3 because they had access to files they shouldn't have had access to and because they worked on the game. So therefore they left one company and made the exact game. Now follow me here with this logic. Right, if somebody gave you a picture of a game or a one minute gameplay of a game, and had a hundred game development studios in a room and said, right, all a hundred of you studios remake that game. You've got 10 months to do it. How many of those studios would buy the exact same asset packs in combination to make it so that all of their files or a substantial portion of their files matched up exactly to the original game? It would not be all of them. Now, what about when you add in art? What about when you add in uh, game design, actual things that happen in the game? that happen in the identical way which we're going to go through in a minute because they do come up that's the point they're making they're not saying that they own the copyright for for files that that are sold on the unreal engine marketplace they're saying in totality outside of an isolated incident outside of a vacuum in totality of the game's production the fact that they bought all of the same assets and put the assets together in the exact same way means that they built the game p3 with the name Dark and Darker, that's what they're saying. That Anyone who's engaging with reality can see that that's what they're saying. If you've not read any of the documentation, if you're not engaged with any of this whatsoever, and you've just heard other people say differently, please stop repeating just uninformed, terrible, terrible information, because you doing so is not helping Iron Mace. Having everybody so uninformed on the actual topic is not going to help them win the case. You're not going to win this one on PR, especially when the PR is just it's just so silly. I think the best thing you can do for Iron Maze and for Dark and Darker, if you're a concerned fan, is to engage with all the reality of the case and then go into it with your eyes open. Not just cope on some literal nonsense lies that just don't exist. And they explain this here. If a game wanted a 3D werewolf character, they could spend the time and resources to make one, or they could go to the Unreal Engine and Marketplace and buy one. They can then use it as the werewolf as is off the shelf, or they can modify and customize it. Many other assets can be purchased, including 3D models. And then they go through examples of other things you can buy. We all know Unreal Engine, cool place, amazing. Nexon was required to use creativity to select the assets that best express this idea for P3. Defendants copied this creative selection. Indeed, Nexon conducted a comparison of the file names underlying P3 and Dark and Darker and discovered the games have 2,338 identical file names, including file names embodying asset purchased from the Unreal Engine Marketplace. As a result of defendants' unimaginative copying of Nexon's selection of Unreal Engine Marketplace assets, the games has a strikingly similar appearance. The examples discussed below are illustrative, but not exhaustive. In gaming, non-player characters, NPCs, unfortunately, what a lot of the people engaging with this story uh, displaying the characteristics of, is a character controlled by the computer rather than a human player. Both P3 and Dark and Darker feature scary monster NPCs that attack human-controlled characters. A developer using the Unreal Engine Marketplace has an unfathomably large selection of pre-existing monsters from which to choose. Instead of selecting a unique set of monsters for Dark and Darker, defendants largely copied the choices Nexon made in P3. Zombie Zombie. So skeleton Wizard Skeleton Wizard. Mimic Mimic. Wraith Wraith. Cave Troll cr Cave Troll. These are all the same assets. Now, Nexon's about to drop that fucking hammer with his statement, because when I read this, I was just like, I, lawyers are smart people, and there was such a concise manner to say this, and I've just failed to do it. In their public statements, defendants contested that it was fine for defendants to steal Nexon's selection of assets because each individual asset is, by itself, owned by the Unreal Engine Marketplace. This was the opinion of the masses. LOL. Iron Mace just fucking own Nexon because they said, you don't own assets. We bought the assets. You, what are you talking about? Defendant's contention is contrary to the Copyright Act, which protects, quote, 
a work formed by the collection and assembling of pre-existing materials or of data that are selected, coordinated, or arranged in such a way that the resulting work as a whole constitutes an original work of authorship. This is the literal copyright act. What they're copywriting is not the assets, it's the collection and the totality of the work arranged and coordinated in this exact manner. That is their point, not that they own the assets individually. The Copyright Act's position is sensible, defendant's position is not. If defendants were correct, any developer who purchased assets from the Real Engine Marketplace would have no protection for the overall look and feel of their games. True and real. No matter how creative a developer's selection of assets, the selection could be copied at will by any other developer. Works of enormous creativity would be left unprotected by copyright simply because the building blocks of the work came from the Unreal Engine Marketplace. N then nobody would use it. Like, no big companies would ever use assets. The law does not treat other creative works in this manner. English language books are protected by copyright, even though they are built from the same 26 letters of the alphabet owned by nobody. Because again, it's the building blocks that build into the idea, the idea is the unique copyrighted material. The idea, how it's put together, how it's built, that is the thing, not the building blocks originally. Most of Western music is built by arranging 12 notes owned by nobody, but songwriters receive broad protection for their works. This is the most common sense point of them all, with a great two examples. The Copyright Act does not provide for any lesser protection to video games. Yet, yeah, it's not written in there. It doesn't say, Unreal Engine assets, you can steal somebody's game. In addition to copying the player co characters and NPCs, defendants also copied the visual appearance of the game settings. For example, Nexon selected the door below from the Unreal Engine marketplace, but customized it by making it wider than the stock door. Defendants selected exactly the same door as Nexon for Dark and Darker and, or on information and belief, widened it in the same manner. So the example they're making here again, they got an asset and not only did they have the asset, is they modified it and then Dark and Darker modified it in the same way. And as you can see here, P3 plays it in a campfire to congregate with other players to replenish their health. In Dark and Darker, you sit in a campfire in the exact same way to do the exact same thing. That's crazy, right? P3 takes place in a unique yellow orangey light. In addition, taking months of trial and error to perfect, choosing this lighting required more than the minimal level of creativity to be protected as authorship. Dark and Darker chose pre precisely the same lighting. Again, weak point on its own, but in totality, a, a point that goes in with along with everything else. One of the main themes in P3 is the juxtaposition of light and dark. Thus, P3 will uh, introduce torch-related game features that allow players to illuminate or extinguish the torches installed in the dungeon to increase or decrease visibility. Dark and Darker also includes the torch-related game feature that allows the players to turn on turn off the torches. In both games, the outline of the torch lights up in yellow when the function is activated. When developing P3, Nexon developed distinctive forms of action and movement that extended the minimal level of creativity required for a work of authorship. For example, in P3, Players can open treasure chests. In most other games, in real life, the action would consist of reaching for the lid. You know, here's the lid. Oh, we're going to open the treasure chest, right? Terrible example. I'm sorry. In P3, however, characters move their hands in a distinctive circular motion over the chest without physically touching the chest. Similarly, characters in P3 can bandage their wounds by using a distinctive circular hand motion, as depicted in the snapshots below. Defendants copied the same motions in Dark and Darker. As you can see, doing the same things because they're the same game. P3 also contains this stealth mode where players can hide from other players in their environment. While the idea of stealth mode is not unique to P3, it uniquely expresses it by turning the gameplay screen in grayscale as depicted below. As you can see, same shit. Now grayscale in stealth is, is in games just like this is in games, just like this is in... All of these things have been in games before. They're not arguing that they own the right to expression of any one of these things. They're saying in totality, how could you make this game be so close to the other game without doing what they're saying you did? When we know you provably worked there, you provably took the files, you provably would not hand over the server to prove you didn't do these things. Like, I'm not sure how many more things you could provably do before people just go, yeah, you've got a point there, right? Whether it's legally actionable, again, not my, not my fight. Then they talk about, of course, the buffs or shields. One example is the buff bubble, illustrated in a way unique to P3. Where the buff bubble is activated, the character is encapsulated in a sheer protective red bubble with a thicker outline. Dark and Darker did the same, but it's blue. In both games, there are potions that provide restorative powers. In P3, the potion flask lights up and is fastened to the character's waist. While restorative potions are a common feature in Dungeon Call games, the light up feature and the placement of flask are unique to P3. Moreover, returning to the theme of light and darkness in P3, Nexon's developers consciously added the light up feature which illuminates the surrounding setting. Defendants copied this, so as you can see, same shit. Narrative elements. 
Several unique elements uh, to immerse the player in the unique world. For example, players in P3 can immerse the game in a tavern. Players in the tavern can communicate with each other. They may also use their weapons on each other for fun, but the weapons do not actually inflict damage in the tavern or otherwise affect the game. Once players form a party in the tavern, they are transported to the dungeon where weapons can inflict damage and the intense gameplay begins. The tavern is a unique feature of P3. Defendants copied the tavern. They call it the Gathering Call, though it is the same narrative purpose. Similarly, as noted above, players in P3 can rest and restore their health while sitting on a campfire. In Dark and Darker, players can rest and restore their health while sitting by a campfire in identical poses. Both P3 and Dark and Darker take the players through a similarly structured dungeon basement. Specifically, P3 team built a 5-level dungeon that is an inverted pyramid structure, unlike cryptocurrency that is a pyramid structure. On information belief, the... I can't help myself. The multi-level inverted pyramid structure dungeon is replicated in Dark and Darker. Defendants have announced that the first level of the dungeon will be revealed in the fifth playtest, which just came out, they released it on a torrent, they even changed the game so you're no longer in a tavern at the beginning. Why would you be doing that? Why would you now be in a forest solo? Is it something to do with the coding of the game that was done through Steam and they had to, you know, jerry-rig this this feature uh, to circumvent basically that they're, re they're releasing it without Steam's multiplayer services? I don't know. Maybe. Or maybe it's because they're trying to, you know, change the game a little bit to make this seem less bad. The P3 team thought long and hard about how they could, you know, build the dungeon basically. They decided to have a spatial control feature in P3 in the form of Poison Fog that would guide the players to a certain location of the dungeon where the other players are located. Iron Mace uh, implemented the same spatial feature control renamed Dark Swarm that forces players to a certain location in the dungeon in Dark and Darker. Finally, the premise of both the games uh, involve a premise where adventurers hear a rumour that they may find riches and form a quest party to embark on an adventure into the dungeon filled with monsters and treasures. And then they go through the descriptions of the game, which, again, are incredibly similar. And as a result, they've made a game that is substantially the same as the game they worked on for Nexon, paid to develop by Nexon. The rest of this is going through why they're bringing this in, in Washington, specifically in the United States. Again, it's because Steam, it's because they're using AWS servers. Both of these companies have agreements that say, if you're using these service or services, then you agree to, you know, be have litigation brought in the US, and then they go over also why the majority of the player base is in the US, 38.67% is, is, is based in the United States, and how they've run promotional campaigns in the United States, and how they direct all of their communication to the United States. And then what do they want? What are their claims for relief? Well, they claim that it's put forward in a manner, manner of the law in the court that all these things are true, that they're the owner of the trade secrets and all that good stuff. So due to all these things that they claim that Nexon are suffering harm, that they've done this, you know, knowingly, Nexon is entitled to one preliminary and permanent injunctive relief, an award for damages for actual losses, an award of damages for unjust enrichment, a reasonable royalty, exemplary damages in an amount of two times the damages awarded, and an award of its attorney's fees. Then, of course, they do the same for the copyright infringement. The first one was for trade secrets. And what exactly are they talking about here? They're talking about preliminary and permanently enjoining defenders, their officers, employees, agents, subsidiaries, representatives, distributors, dealers, members, affiliates, internet service providers, and all persons acting in concert or participation with them from misappropriating plaintiff's P3 and infringing plaintiff's copyright works, including by copying, marketing, distributing, or publicly performing Dark and Darker or any game substantially similar to the P3 game. They have to deliver all of the materials back to Nexon. They have to give them money and all of these things. Now, what could this mean? Well, now that it's over, uh, I'll never be sober. Great song. Now, that was a lot to go through. Uh, what do I think is going to happen? I obviously am of the opinion that this is way too much to ignore and that Iron Mace are definitely in the wrong. Are they legally going to be actionable claims? I don't know. I think they should be, probably. If what Nexon are saying are true, and again, a lot of these things are so easily provable, then I think Nexon have a very strong case, and it's also a very important case. And I know a lot of people in the industry think that this is the case as well, because a lot of things when it comes to copyright is um, looking at is something a market replacement? Is it a market substitute for the original uh, body of work, essentially? Is P3 and Nexon damaged by this game being created in the identical manner by the people who shouldn't have been able to create it in this identical way? Yes, of course it is. I don't think anyone can argue otherwise. Does this suck for gamers, in a way? If this gets to the point where Nexon wins, and of course, I'm not saying that if Nexon wins, that means Dark and Darker never comes out because that's not guaranteed to happen. There's a million ways this can go and I'll try and explain a couple. But in another way, it doesn't suck for gamers because realistically, would big companies, uh, would we be better in the industry without big companies? 
Probably not on the on the overall right i think they have pros and cons they make a lot of like high production value games they make games that a majority of people play and they pump a lot of money into the industry and some of them write games for instance put a bunch of money into indie developers next on we're essentially trying to do this with this game and some others at the time i think obviously there's a point to be made about like oh you know fuck big corporations and indie games for the win and i love indie games and they're the ones i predominantly play but at the same time if you just allowed this to happen they wouldn't be making games like this anymore like it would inevitably harm the industry if they just said yeah you're allowed to do this you're allowed to take the files you're allowed to do all these things if provable again their allegations and essentially rip off a game that had been paid for in whole essentially by another company it would be an untenable manner for the industry to operate in so is it bad for this individual game yeah if you wanted this game to come out but again i will just say even if nexon win they could just order that they change the game and that this damage is paid they could settle uh, out of court. They could settle with Nexon becoming like a publisher or something for the game. There's a, there's a million ways this can go. They could win on all these things and get paid and the game doesn't have to change at all. There's so many things that can happen. Just because Nexon says, I want X, Y, and Z because this happened doesn't mean that's what's going to be awarded to them, even if they win. Shit like this takes literally years, guys. This will take years. Now, what's going to happen in the interim? It's really hard to say because we have some precedent from, from similar companies uh, having things like this happen. Myth of Empires is a good example where they were blocked from releasing on Steam and they eventually start, started selling the game on their own website. Now, I'm not familiar enough with that case to know whether or not there was an injunction filed and whether it was denied or not of having the company essentially not be able to operate service or sell the product. So could IMACE do that? Potentially, I don't know. Could they continue to uh, proliferate the game, basically, and have people play via a torrent? Potentially, I don't know. Because this was filed on the 14th of April, so it's it's like two days ago. It's basically right as the playtest was starting, I personally don't think it was a good idea for them to release a torrent of the game and start operating the game when they knew this was happening. They they literally knew this had just happened. I don't think that's going to help them. But at the same time, I don't know what I do in their position. I don't know what lawyer advice they've got. There's so many moving parts to this that it's really impossible for anyone to say unless you're a lawyer specifically familiar with the case on both sides and also, of course, the specific laws that this is pertaining to in Washington specifically. So there's a million ways this can go, but there's no doubt in my mind that this is going to be incredibly interesting to follow because this sets a precedent moving forward for the games industry and is also by two big companies. People love Iron Mace, people love Dark and Darker, people fucking hate Nexon. So it's going to be real interesting to see where it goes and I'll definitely be following up with all the coverage as I have been doing and trying to at least, you know, give you the, in my opinion, what is the most logical, consistent approach uh, to the information that we've, we've got so far which I know is not the popular thing I should be saying. Lol, look at this document, Nexon, so dumb, dumb. But just not going to do it, am I? There we go. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Peace out.